morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome to our series in Fall Mission Vision, Greater Things. Certainly when we reflect on the last 10 years here at St. Peter and 922 Ministry, the core of 922 Ministry, meaning we want to reach all people by all possible means, certainly we have seen great things. I looked back at the membership about 10 years ago, the members we had, about eight, 850 people. Today we number over 2,200 souls between our north and south campus. As we look at the future, where will God take us? We've now purchased a larger place, the Thompson Center for the Corps and 922 Ministry, to reach even more souls, more people, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We think about that gathering route and how God has blessed it. We might think of groups. Since serving here in the last four years, starting up groups here at our North Campus, between our two campuses, over the last four years, over 500 people, 500 members, have either been involved with a seasonal Bible study or with a life group. You look at the numbers, we have 2,200 souls, about 600 are 18 or younger, so that leaves about 1,600 people. You look at three, 500 souls, so 33% of our people have been involved with the group. You go, wow, what a blessing. We can think about the growth aspect. I mean, why we're here, to focus on our faith in Jesus Christ. And I wonder how many of us can say, I have grown in my faith. In other words, I have a greater understanding of, of Scripture, and I'm more solid in my faith when the winds of life blow. I suspect many of us can say that as we think about the past, how God has blessed us. And then there's the give. This past uh, summer, there was a meeting to talk about budget. $2.9 million. Wow, that's a lot of money. And as I sat in that congregational meeting and looked around, we approved that budget, and there was li simply little or no discussion. I thought to myself, really? That we're not going to talk about this? $2.9 million. Wow, we've grown. But it's not just offerings. It's the gifts that people have used. It's the energy. It's the resources. It's the expertise that members at both campuses have brought forth to support ministry and to support the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are both gathered here and to our community. And then there is the go. I don't know how often we as pastors, after Sunday, talk to each other and, and we say, did you know that couple, that individual, that family that was here on Sunday morning, I have no idea who they were. And that's because of the go. That's because you as God's people continue to invite friends and family and coworkers and neighbors and those around you to come here to St. Peter, to come to the core, 922 Ministries, to be all things to all people so that they can hear about their Savior, Jesus Christ. We can look at these different aspects of ministry, the G's of the past, and go, wow, God has done some great things. And when we look at that, we, won't, we don't want to be full of ourselves, get full of pride, but we want to point the finger at God. And to say, God, to you, all praise and honor and glory and strength and wisdom be to you because of what you have accomplished in just this little corner of the kingdom. And so I pray for God's blessing upon this series as we look at the different aspects, as the different pastors walk us through the different G's of our ministry life here at St. Peter and the Core. And this morning we want to take a look at the, the gather route. And as we do that, we're going to make use of a parable from the Bible, Gospel of Luke. A parable is an earthly story with a spiritual truth. We're going to look at the parable of the lost sheep, but to understand it better, we want to understand that this little story is really just one part of five little stories that are together. You see, there's the parable of the lost sheep, and if you look at the percentage there, what we're reminded of, God is concerned about the one, 99%. God's not satisfied with that. He wants all to hear. And then following this little story, there's another story about a, a woman 
She loses a coin. coin. It's only one out of ten, but she finds it and she rejoices. And that tells us God is concerned about the 10%. And then there's another story about the two sons, or one son. We call it the prodigal son. He takes his father's inheritance. He runs off. He spends it lavishly. He returns home in repentance, and his father hugs him. And depending on how you look at that percentage there, God is concerned about the 50%. And if you look at both sons, God's concerned about the husband. 100%, both of them. So however you look at that, those three stories teach us that God wants us to, to search. God is concerned about all. And following those three stories, there's a little story about a manager. He manages his boss's money, but he mismanages it, and he uses it for his own benefit. And Jesus commands him and says, well done. And basically by telling the story, he's telling us, prepare. Prepare. Search. Prepare. And then finally that, there's a little story about the rich man and poor Lazarus. Poor Lazarus is a believer. He dies and goes to heaven and is in glory. And the rich man who loved his possessions goes to hell. And Jesus is teaching with that see heaven and hell. Search, prepare, and see heaven and hell. Jesus told all of these stories together. And as we get into that first story of the lost sheep, it's helpful to know where Jesus is and and what's going on. So please be patient with me a little bit longer as we do some background here. Jesus is making his final trip to Jerusalem. He he knows what awaits there, his passion, his suffering, and his cross. And along the way as he goes, there are those following him, and they're both ends of the social spectrum. On the one hand, there is the tax collectors. They're called sinners. If you have an NIV Bible, look at it in parentheses, the sinners. Yes, they sinned. We sin. All people sin. But they were stereotyped. And that was because some of those tax collectors were dishonest. And they used the money for themselves as well and became wealthy. And so your average Jewish person looked at them and said, you are taking advantage of us, and not only that, you work for the Roman government. You're bloodsuckers, you're traitors. And because of that, the tax collectors were excluded from worship in the temple and the synagogue. They were kind of down and out. And Jesus was concerned about them. On the other end of the social spectrum were the Pharisees. We know them. They were men of influence and power and wealth. And they were religious. And they were good at it, at least from an outward standpoint. And Jesus, as he tells this parable, is really asking this question. Do you, who are so religious, do you care for those who are down and out? Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus begins to ask that question. It's really the question for us. Do we care about the lost sheep, those who have strayed? Do we care about them? Jesus shows us how to in these next words. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? I'm wondering how many of you have experienced a test of some type in the last week. How many of you have experienced a test? For some of the grade schoolers here, maybe you're back in school now at Freedom or St. Peter, and maybe you experienced a test, right? Reading test? Spelling test? Spelling test, yes. Okay. So maybe for some of the kids here, you had that spelling test. And maybe you got an 85% on it? 90%? 95% maybe? Right? If we get that, we're thinking, wow, that's really good. You take that spelling test home to mom or dad, and and guess what, mom and dad? I got 95%. And mom and dad say, awesome. Good job. You passed. Or maybe for some of our teenagers here, maybe you recently took the driver's test. That happened in my household not too long ago. And if you've taken that test, you realize there's two parts to it, right? 
There is the written test. There is the behind the wheel. And for my son, he took the written test. He did pretty well. He got a 90% and he passed behind the wheel. Came home, Dad, I got my driver's license. Great. Now my insurance rates go up. <laughs> but he passed the test, right? It was good enough, right? Or maybe for some of our, our older folks here, maybe there was a, a medical test we went in for. And they check you over, and they check your oxygen. You put that little thing on your finger, and you know what the number is. If you had it done, you know what the number is. It's 90%. If you can get a 90, that means there's oxygen going to your brain, oxygen going to your body. You're, you're doing well enough. So that's kind of the target there. So I'm, uh, I'm guessing some of us have experienced that test. I'm seeing some heads go, yeah. When we take those tests, whether it's spelling tests, driving tests, health tests, what do we focus on? The 90, the 95%. Right, look how good I did. Look what I got right. Not many of us think to ourselves, oh my goodness, I got five wrong or three wrong or 50. We don't, we don't think that way. Most of us don't. I mean, some of us are perfectionists, but most of us don't think that way. And yet when we look at this parable of Jesus, when it comes to percentage, our God does not think that way. He is not happy, in a sense, if 90% or 95 or even 99, he wants the one, that 1% to gather and to return and to be part of the flock once again. And so what is God teaching us? What was Jesus teaching to those tax collectors who were following him? God cares about you. And you are important to God. And Jesus gives us that picture of that man who goes out searching. He goes out on the hills. He goes to the valley. He goes to the prairie. He's in the woods. He just goes and goes. I'm going to show you a picture for a moment. See if you can figure out what message I'm sending here. Anyone recognize that? We know the saying that goes with that, right? It just keeps going and going and going. Now maybe this is trivial, but we have that saying in our head. But that's really the flavor and the idea behind the Greek verb that Jesus uses here. To keep going and going and going. In other words, God's love for you and God's love for the tax collector, God's love for sinners and those who have strayed does not stop. And that's our second point and second takeaway today. God's love for you never stops stops. See, that's a remarkable thing. When you think about it, that God loves never stops for people. Because when it comes to gathering, sometimes we stray in our thoughts. Sometimes we stray in our actions. Sometimes we maybe physically stray and we say, I, I don't want to gather. I wonder how many times I have said to my wife, other pastors on staff, maybe even to you as members, I need to write a sermon. I have to get it done. I have to do this. I need to. Really? Jim? You, you have to do it. You have to prepare a sermon for God's people? No, Pastor Jim. It's, it's a joy. It's a blessing. It is a privilege, an opportunity to talk about our God and the great things that he has done for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Pastor Jim, it's a blessing. And so if you hear me say in the future, I need to write a sermon, say, no, Pastor Jim, you, you get to, right? How about for us, pastor and people? How many of you this morning woke up, jumped out of bed, yes, we get to go worship this morning and gather with God's people, and I can't wait to get there, and I'm going to sit in the front row this morning. I'm so anxious to get there. Some of you did that, whether because you're early or late, I don't know, <laughs> right? Anyone wake up this morning? Man, I just can't wait to get there to gather with God's people, right? Coffee first, can I find my way there to that? Sometimes we're not so excited about gathering. And then there's Jesus' question. Jesus' question, do you care about that one straying person? 
See, we can look at our numbers and go, wow, 2,200 souls. Look where we were 10 years ago. We keep growing and adding people. Do we really need to be concerned about those who, who are not here? Do we need to be concerned about them? See, our Lord and Savior reflects his love to us to say, I'm concerned about you. Our prayers, Lord, help me to be concerned about those who are not here. Why is it, brothers and sisters, that we enjoy God's grace? It is because of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is it not? Just think for a moment how he kept going and going and going. There were obstacles in his way, there were. We think of political things. There was a man named Herod who had kind of a unique perspective on Jesus. He both liked him and wanted to kill him at the same time. Certainly that was an obstacle for Jesus. You might think of Jesus' own friends. At times, they got in the way of his mission to deter him. There was Satan who would tempt Jesus at times to keep him from going and going and going. There were the Pharisees. There were the religious types. There were so many that tried to place obstacles in Jesus' way and on his mission to save souls. And yet Jesus just kept going and going and going. Brothers and sisters, do you see the heart of your God and his passion and his zeal for the down and outcast of society, for those who sin and stray, and for you, brothers and sisters, for you? And so there's the question that we want to look at. Who is the straying person that you know? Who is that straying person? Brothers and sisters, I don't have to tell you these things, but I'm going to walk through them. There are simply things that, that Satan would place in our path, in the path of others, that would keep them from gathering. Maybe there has been a break in a marriage, and the person is full of guilt. Can I go to God's house? I'm embarrassed to be around others. That can be a barrier that Satan uses. Or maybe there's some hurt or habit or hang-up that a person is struggling with. I don't know if I can go to God's house because of this thing in my life that's going on right now. Or maybe there's some dysfunction in the family, something I'm embarrassed about. I don't want my brothers and sisters in Christ to know, and so I, I stay away. Or maybe it's just simply apathy. Just get out of the habit of going. Brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm asking you, who is that person that you can pray for and encourage. Who is that person? See, Jesus gives us and shows us that heart of our Savior. He shows us why we come to God's house to worship. There is joy, there is a blessing as we think about those who are not here. You see, we come and do the very thing that Jesus talks about in his parable when he says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. We come here and we use the words of sin and grace. This morning we used the words of King David to confess our sins, but we also read those words of forgiveness and love and restoration. And that is the message that we want to share with those around us, those we don't see. And this is where Jesus leads us. And when he finds it, that is the sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 persons who do not need to repent. Can I tell you for a moment about a ministry here at St. Peter, 922 Ministry, the core of 922 Ministry? It's called the One Team. You ever heard of it? Maybe some of you have heard that. It's a group of people who are gathered together who make that telephone call who are concerned about that member who has become disconnected or is straying. Now maybe I should preface this and just tell you, side note, anyone know what my number one is, strength finders? What my number one is as a person? I know one person who knows. It's empathy. Empathy, for better or worse. That means I, I care about people. When my wife found that out, she looked at me and said, really? 
it's true, right? But I care for people, I do. So when I encourage our team members, I, I'm not doing it because I'm trying to be mean or I'm calling someone out, I, I care. And so do the members of our team. So at four weeks, we don't see someone, we want to make a telephone call and to pray with that person, to leave a prayer on their phone if they don't answer it. And at eight weeks, we make another phone call to encourage that disconnected member. At three weeks, there's a letter. I don't like letters. I don't like letters. I don't like getting them in the mail, but we want to reach that person. And at 16 weeks, there's another letter. At five weeks, there's a phone call for me because I care. At six months, there's a discussion. Do you want to remain a member at St. Peter the Core because it doesn't appear you want to be part of our church family anymore? But we want to make that effort as Jesus guides us to reach that one because every single soul is important to our Savior. And so can I ask you to do this with me? If you know a, a person, a member who has strayed, can you share that information with me as pastor? Maybe there are circumstances going on. Maybe we don't have an email or a phone number to follow up with that person. Sometimes we don't even have an address. But if you know, can you partner with the one team, partner with me to give information? It's all confidential. It remains that way. But brothers and sisters, we want to make every effort to reach that soul because of where our Savior Jesus leads us. Now we can look at those numbers for a moment. 2,200 souls. Do you realize that on our disconnected list, we probably have 250, 300 people? I think 2,200 souls, 300 people, that's about 10 to 15 percent are disconnected. Most churches in Christianity, 40, 50, 60 percent don't worship regularly or at all. We can look at that percentage and go, well, 50, that is incredible, that is great, and it is, and it is a reason to thank God. But just because we keep growing, we don't want to forget about the 10, 15 percent that are not connected. And so will you partner with me, pray? about that? Think about that, brothers and sisters, when it comes to the gather room? Right? Would you do that? Let's look at our final portion of scripture here, where Jesus leads us. And when he finds the sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. For those who are parents here, have teenagers, uh, whose kids are now, have that driver's license, maybe this has happened to you, maybe you've heard about someone this has happened to you. Maybe the junior missus says, I got my license now, mom and dad. Can I go out tonight? Yep, you sure can. Please be home at 11. Okay, I will. 11 o'clock comes around. Junior's not home. It's 11.15. Text, where are you? 11.30. Phone call. I don't know if I should be worried or angry with you. 11.45. Okay. I'm getting ready. 12 o'clock. Junior finally shows up and comes back home. Where have you been? What have you been doing? I have been worried sick. I can't believe you did this to me. How could you do this? What was going on? You ever heard about that happening to a parent? That ever happened to you? No? Good. I'm glad to hear that it's never happened to anyone here, ever. Good. Right? Has that ever happened? Right? Can you do this for me, please? 2,200 souls, we as a pastoral staff don't know any, everyone. But if you see someone who comes through those doors and you know that they don't get here very often, please don't go up to them and go, where have you been? What have you been doing? You know how worried I've been about you? But please just go up, shake their hand, Give a smile, good to see you, and rejoice. And rejoice because the angels are. Brothers and sisters, I pray that God's blessing falls upon our ministry and all that goes on here, especially when it comes to our gather. It is my prayer as well that God would bless us as a gathering of his people in his kingdom as we make our way through this series to give thanks for the many blessings that God has showered upon us. Let's close our sermon theme here message with a video up there. Hey, 922 family. 
My name's Denise, and I've been a part of our church for five years now. The Gather Root is a big deal to me because it's really important for me to get to be a part of my friends and family's faith journey and for them to get to be a part of mine. When I don't gather, I've noticed my life tends to be lonely. But when I focus on gather, I see God bless me with relationships and a great peace that surrounds me. I thank God for my church family and all the support they've given me, and I can't wait to see what greater things he has in store. Let's close with a prayer. Lord Jesus, you show us your heart in the heart of our God. The zeal, the love, and the passion for the lost. Lord, we thank you that you have found each of us and called us back to you, given us faith and strengthened. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us that same heart of zeal to see those who are struggling, those who are the outcasts, those brothers and sisters that are dealing with things in some way. We pray, Lord, that you grant us strength, that you give us words, the actions, a plan to follow up on them. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to gather. Bless our worship today and all that we hear. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen.